Okay, everyone, thank you very much for making a, a very prompt return back to the room. Um, hopefully you've all enjoyed your lunch. Uh, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Ursula Lavery, and I am the Technical and Research and Development Director at Moy Park, and I'm sure all of you know Moy Park. Um, so we're a, a poultry producer, food producer within Northern Ireland. I have been with the company for 30 years. I started off as a graduate trainee within Moy Park, and... Um, I'm now for my sins um, in the role that I'm in in terms of technical and research and development. I'm absolutely delighted to be with you today and to chair this session. And I think this session will absolutely keep us all wide awake and stimulated for the next hour and a half. We have two great speakers and I'll introduce them in a few minutes. But as you've probably seen from, from your itinerary, in terms of our topic this afternoon, it's, it's extremely pertinent and it's extremely much to the forefront of what's happening within our environment as we sit. And we're talking about the role of land management. So as you probably know, sustainable intensification is absolutely the buzzword that's going around at the minute. And the demand for food globally is growing at a completely enormous pace within the world. The population is expected to top 9.7 billion by 2050. And we will need 50% more food by 2050. And from our point of view, science and technology will be the key to solving this problem. So this is about protecting and developing the land that we have. So we have a finite amount, so we have to ensure that we protect it and develop it. So as I said, we have two great speakers. So we're going to start this afternoon with Dr. John Gilliland, who is currently the chair of the expert working group on sustainable land management. And you probably know, John is a director of agriculture at Devonish Nutrition and a former president of the Ulster Farmer Union and has a unique and breadth experience in the world of farming, food, environment and energy. We're also joined this afternoon by Dr. Danaha Dodi Dodi from AFPI. And Danaha is the program leader for catchment science research in AFPI, focusing on mitigating the impact of land use on aquatic ec ecosystems. And both, both of those uh, individuals will be providing us with great insight, science, and evidence on the topic of land management. So I'd like to invite John to join us, please. Um, thank you very much, Ursula. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for uh, inviting me along here and to, and to just share some of the uh, experience we had on our road trip uh, over the last three years. Um, what I want to do, first of all, is publicly thank the scientists within AFPI, but actually the science community beyond AFPI as well. In our work, we sought knowledge and science right across the breadth of the British Isles, trying to understand um, what is the current state of knowledge, where are our gaps, how do we fill them, and actually how do we utilise the knowledge that we have got. Um, so can I thank very much from the start, on behalf of the expert working group, specifically the work that, and the support we got from the scientists within AFPI. I also want to thank the expert working group they have had to put up with me as a chair for three years. Um, we were born out of the Going for Growth document. Recommendation 22 said that if we were to achieve our aims, we needed to create a sustainable land management strategy for Northern Ireland. For our sins, um, we um, were chosen. And the sustainable land management strategy um, was put together specifically as a multi-stakeholder group to get consensus. So we had leading members of environmental NGOs, we had leading farmers, we also had civil servants, and we had people from the food chain to really then to challenge uh, the, the roadway we had to go forward. We published the Sustainable Land Management Strategy in October 2016, and got instant recognition from the European Commission where we were used as an exemplar at the DG Environment, DG Agriculture Workshop 
in Bratislava four days after it was launched. And then this time last year, the EIP Agri Newsletter singled out Northern Ireland as inspirational, which is a very strong word and true reflection of the collective approach that we took. I want to personally thank the members of the expert working group because it was a fantastic experience. And can I say, without exception, everybody engaged, put their pennies worth in, and then we found consensus somewhere in the middle. And I certainly found it a fascinating uh, process to chair and privilege to chair. So our, our remit um, within the working group was laid down for us in going for growth. And summarised, it was asked to increase the sector's output in line with the strategy, increase farmers' margins, reduce the sector's footprint, and if that wasn't enough, please do it simultaneously. Our audience, primarily, first and foremost, were farmers, because... Farmers are absolutely pivotal to how we go forward, and without them, we will never deliver the agri-food industry as an engine for growth in this economy. But they're not the only audience. And so many times, so much of what we believe has to be the vision of our roadmap going forward needs engagement from policymakers and regulators. Farmers cannot do it on their own. We need to bring everybody along with us. And it was great being able to have access to policymakers and regulators on our journey. But without exception, everyone in the working group accepted that regardless what we as farmers or what policymakers and regulators wanted, the ultimate customer were the people who consumed our product. And ultimately, that was the way we felt that the industry had to go. And a lot of what I'm going to say is with that focus. Our methodology was very clear. What is the current state of science out there? What are the science gaps out there? And how do we get uptake? Because actually, everyone in this room, I believe, is passionate about science. But I will be provocative and say I would suspect that our, our science toolbox is probably 60 or 70% full. Our toolbox for behavioral change is probably only 20% full. And actually, one of the biggest challenges we face is actually how do we use the current knowledge we have today to actually get betterment as we invest in new knowledge for the future. So when we started in 2016, we needed to benchmark where was the industry. On environmental performance, there were some positives. If you compare where we were in 2004, if you look at nitrogen, our nitrogen balance since then was down 10%. Our efficiency of use was up 12%. Most importantly, in phosphate, our balance was down 32%. Our efficiency was up 28.5%. Against, in the case of nitrates and water, against the ceiling of 50 milligrams, certainly on nitrates, we didn't have a massive water quality issue. But there was a big but. And the but around that is that 62% of our water bodies were failing good quality status against an EU average of 47%. Something that we cannot be complacent about. When we started to drill in what was causing our problem on, on, on water quality, phosphate reared its head. And actually something that was new to us as we went through our working process is up to 80% of phosphate actually entered water courses, not through soils at all, but through overland flow during periods of extreme rainfall. And that absolutely changed our view about how we should tackle water quality. On top of that, it was very clear that phosphate hung around in the environment for far longer than we expected. And certainly, uh, wisdom is now saying that phosphate can have a legacy tail for up to 50 years, completely different to nitrogen. If we then looked at biodiversity, there are 49 priority habitats in Northern Ireland or around Northern Ireland, only one is at favourable status. And in fact, 75% of the ones on land, that's 38 of them, was impacted by ammonia. I want to spend the next two slides, just two or three slides, just talking about ammonia. It would be fair to say in my 
20 years as a policy advocate, I actually haven't been challenged as much as we were on the whole subject of ammonia and the ammonia annex that we published in January time. Um, contrary to what some of agriculture media still says, ammonia is not a greenhouse gas. But when it goes up into the air, it normally comes back within about a 15-mile radius as nitrogen deposition. And if you're a plant that normally uh, is in an, in an environment of low nitrogen, you can get luxury uptake. And so the two photographs there on the right-hand side uh, shows what excessive nitrogen deposition from the atmosphere can do to species like lichen. It can aggravate greenhouse gases because when nitrogen comes down and lands on wet soils, where the nitrogen cycle goes to nitrous oxide, that nitrogen deposition can be re-released as nitrous oxide, which is 296 times more potent than carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas. And also, when the nitrogen is in the atmosphere, if there are other atmospheric pollutants, can react with them, causing considerable particulates and impact on human health. So, where does ammonia come from? And the reason I want to take this time is what was very clear in our process is about 98% of the people we spoke to had no knowledge of ammonia. So I'm sorry, I'm, I'm taking two or three slides just to walk people through. So these two pie charts have come from Tom Misselbrook of Rossenstead. He oversees the National Infantry in Ammonia Missions. These are for Northern Ireland. And the highlights for me, again, showing my personal ignorance of ammonia, is for whatever reason, I thought ammonia was just a problem of pig and poultry. Well, I was wrong. And certainly 73% of ammonia emissions in Northern Ireland come from ruminants. If we then delve into production systems, 44% of that comes from manure storage and spreading. 38% comes from housing and hard stands. And actually, the one that causes the least damage is animals grazing outside. And the reason that is, is when urine and dung do not mix, which is normally what happens when cows are grazing outside, you don't get ammonia produced or you get little ammonia produced. So one of the key recommendations in the land management strategy was about utilizing grass better, trying to lengthen the grazing season. Bingo, delivers for ammonia reduction too. And the more that we can get resilience on our grazing platform, the better. So how do we compare? It's always good to benchmark ourselves with our competitors. This was done earlier on. Um, uh, Chief Vett was just talking about TB and our comparison with Scotland. Well, here's our comparison on ammonia, both across UK and the Republic of Ireland. And this is on ammonia emissions uh, per square kilometre. Uh, so you could understand why there is a spotlight on in Northern Ireland. If I come back then and look at our snapshot of where we found agriculture in 2016, if I look then at the production side of the house, we were coming into this at the back end of two really miserable years of farm profits. When we delved into that, agriculture in Northern Ireland, when you take out the intensive sector, is predominantly a grass-based industry. And some things really surprised us. If you benchmark, one of the key metrics for us was grass utilization per hectare. Not grass growth, grass utilization, turning grass into money. We know our top 5% are being able to utilize up to 16 ton per hectare per year dry matter. Yet the Northern Ireland average is 5.1. And that splits between dairy at 7.5 and dry stock at 4. So we have plenty of headspace. When we delved into what was causing that, what was extraordinary is the complete lack of knowledge of the soils that drive our main crop, grass. And as a, an arable farmer, which is where I come from, I actually found that astonishing. Only 2% of our land is analysed on, on an annual basis. 64% um, of our soils are not touching, reaching optimal pH of 6 and above. If you looked at total fertility, only 18% of our soils 
were at optimal fertility and compounded by structural problems. The Chief Vet mentioned earlier on today about Conacre. Well, Conacre does the environment or productivity no favours either. 11-month lease does not give um, structural confidence in tenants to invest. And it's really interesting to see how far the Republic of Ireland have moved here with their five-year leases and longer and the tax framework that's been put up around that. So one of the key things we said from the outset is there's no point doing this strategy if it's not going to be adopted, if the industry don't engage and take it up. And for us, this is absolutely at its core. And I would urge to the organisers, when you come to think about this conference next year, now that you've done all the juicy subjects this year, uptake and behavioural change is the biggest single question that none of us have got to the bottom of. And so for us, one of the key things we said is whatever we do, it has to be visible, it has to be auditable, it has to be credible, and it has to be profitable. The key principle right through both the land management strategy and the ammonia annex, if you can't measure it, you certainly cannot manage it. Right. Okay. Um, so... I want to spend the next section of my presentation actually looking at our current science and argue that actually we need to get our act together and use it better. And in, in this, I'm going to frame it in the way of measuring and managing. We believe we need to copy the discipline that sectors, our chair from the poultry sector, what do they do? What is the success of both the poultry and the, and the pig industry? They measure, they manage. They go back and they measure and manage again. People said you can't do it at a landscape scale. We believe it can. So right at its front, we need to start at the soils, and we make no apologies for that, bringing in GPS, soil sampling, and analysis. And I'm absolutely delighted for the success of the pilot in Northern Ireland, and particularly the Upper River Band catchment. 20,000 grass fields have now been sampled. We're waiting for the analysis. And of the Upper River Ban catchment, there are roughly 9,500 grass fields, of which 8,000 of them are in the scheme. There is no other catchment in the world that will have such a data set as will come out of that. That differentiates us and leaves us from the front. But it's not good enough just to do the conventional pH, P and K. We must understand soil, organic matter, because the amount of lime you put on land is totally direct to the organic. But you also need to look at ma magnesium and calcium and try and do it in smaller blocks so we can look at precision agriculture and put our nutrient on where it is needed. And I'm focusing on the grass sectors here because actually it is now my experience that our soils under grass, when you discount soil erosion from arable sectors, is in worse shape than the arable sector. For no other reason, they measure and manage the yield they take off arable. We don't do it in grass. And for that, our second key thing is how do we use the current science we have out there to measure our offtake? You know, whether it is manually through a grasshopper or whether it's mechanically through a forager, we need to start measuring what we're taking off in our grass. Likewise, we need to start measuring our water quality. One of the best projects we went to see was the Chagas Agricultural Catchment Pilot, six of them going now eight years in the Republic of Ireland, where they sample water on an hourly basis, and then they feed that into discussion groups. And now they have proper engagement. Farmers actually understand the water quality of the stream or the river going past them and some of their impact. They've had some really fantastic discussion groups one particular one I went was uh, overseen by David Wall of Chagas, a really interactive session. But building on top of that, new precision landscape technologies. Um, so earlier on, we talked about satellites, and I'll say, well, you know, whether we use satellites or whether we use helicopters or drones, it doesn't matter. But these kind of technologies, using LIDAR, which is laser uh, scanning of a landscape, to actually show you properly your topography, and then working with the likes of Rachel Cassidy and AFPI of actually looking at the roots of overland flow and where your critical source areas are. 
So if you're going to do a landscape intervention, you do it where it's needed and you don't do it where it's not needed. And taking it right down on this issue of measuring and managing is actually, in the case of ammonia, one of our problems in ammonia, we only have three monitoring stations and we look at the cumulative ammonia uh, uh, over a three-month period. Yet, activities change on a daily basis. Weather changes on a daily basis. So we need far more sites. We're reckoning 15 plus, and we need daily monitoring and daily weather recording. But when we see benefits coming from mitigation, we recognize it. And you know, one classic one is actually in the poultry industry. Over the last three years, there's been a 95% switch from wet heating to dry heating. Certainly, anecdotal evidence in England is seeing up to a 40% reduction in ammonia, yet that isn't recognized in Northern Ireland. So we need the science behind that, and then the regulators need to recognize where farmers deliver positive change, that is recognized. But keeping on the, on the, on, on the measuring scale, these technologies that are now out there that we haven't been accessing, this LIDAR can actually tell you the amount of carbon that you sequester in your trees and hedges within our ruminant landscape. At the moment, ruminant agriculture has been beaten up because of the methane that cows belch. Yet on those same landscapes owned by the same farmers who own those cows, they've permanent grass, they've got trees, they've got hedges, all consuming greenhouse gases, yet the policy will not recognize this. Yet this technology has now been used to secure carbon credits in Africa by WWF, the largest NGO funded by the German government, the richest member state. The technology is recognized, but we're not allowed to use it here. Policymakers, please take note. But on this, we talked about earlier on a big data. Out of this comes a lot of data. And just like we heard for genetics and for livestock improvement, we need data support on the data we're now going to produce through this. But not only data support, smart decision support tools that can mine that data vertically and give good information to farmers in how they manage. Coming back at a more lower level, how many people in this audience, of the farmers in this audience, ever analyze their slurry or their farmyard manure before spreading it? Simple things we absolutely need to get right. And when we go and put it on, how many of us apply it to where we need it and not apply it where we don't need it? So we need to move to precision and variable rate application systems. And we need to make sure that as we switch to these variable rates, that we put it on in the most environmentally benign way as well. A trailing shoe will reduce ammonia emissions by about 40% compared to a splash plate. I know people hate switching from splash plates. But if we're going to crack ammonia, we're going to have to bite the bullet. So for us, when we looked at the state of the science today, we made two really upfront recommendations. The first one was switching to advanced slurry spreading methods because we believe the science that's there today is inequivocal. And by 2020, we're saying no new splash plates should be sold. And by 2025, the use of splash plates should stop. The other one big one that the science is absolutely on our side is actually switching from can and to ammonia and ammonia to protected ammonia. If you switch from can to, to, to uh, ammonia, you get a 75% reduction in greenhouse gases. Uh, or, sorry, urea. And if you switch from urea to stabilized urea, you get a 78% reduction of ammonia. And certainly, all the trials done both in AFPI and Chagas has shown yield benefits, cost-effective yield benefits of doing that. So looking at then, one of the key remits we had was also to say, well, where's the science gaps? And as I sit here today, I respect that we've just had eight months of rain hell, and particularly where I come from, from the Northwest. But for the two previous seasons, we had land that was drier in the closed period than it was in the open period. And the science is sound in regards, if you put your nutrient on in dry, warm soils, that nutrient will be used far quicker. What we don't know is the new sensor technologies that are out there is in a field situation, 
Could they give us a definitive on that in regards when is the right time to put nutrient on? And so we have said very clearly we need to investigate the use of these new sensor technologies to actually allow us to put nutrient on when the land is ready for it and not by calendar date. Simple things. I know CAFRI have been looking at how we look at quick ready reckoner analysis of slurry is we actually need to get far smarter in how we analyse our slurries and farmyard manures. Where people have to export slurry, we need to understand the biosecurity risk around that. The last thing we want to do is exasperate the TB, but are there other measures we can take to reduce biosecurity? Within the ammonia story, what did horrify us is our current state of knowledge in ammonia is not good. And so we were somewhat astonished to find that in our models that we use to make decisions, slatted floor slurry systems are not included, only concrete floors or systems. And when you've got an a, 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 a issue where when urine and feces mix together, you get big ammonia emissions, you know, not having an emission factor for slatted floors is crazy. We know through livestock nutrition Certainly in the pig sector, for every 1% you reduce crude protein, you reduce ammonia emissions by 10%. Can we validate that? Can we get emission factors for it? Can we see if that's the case for other livestock sectors? I already mentioned in the case of the poultry sector, can we validate the behavioural change that has already taken place? And can we at least give credit for positive behaviour? One of the key assets we've got in our livestock farms are our nutrients, our slurries and our farmyard manures? Are there new biological additives out there that actually can compost those and turn an ammonical nitrogen into microbial nitrogen and actually reduce the amount of nit ammonia that we produce so we spread our nutrients? We found some perverse situations out there for all the right reasons in the world. We encourage slurry bubbler systems to reduce uh, toxic gases so that when we mix slurries we have no human fatalities, which is a, an absolute tragedy that happens in our community. Yet, when we do that, we can see ammonia emissions rising quite dramatically. So we need to understand that science around that. Human life is more important than ammonia, but we can't discount this and we need to understand uh, some of the perverse outcomes then. When it then comes to the economics, because at the end of the day, we cannot encourage people to go down this route unless we understand the cost effectiveness. In the case of ammonia, we don't have a really good handle on the mitigation costs of all our solutions. And when farmers do engage and say, okay, I'm going to modernize my farm, I'm going to look at creating an ammonia mitigation strategy on my farm, it may take two, three, or four different options simultaneously in my farm we don't understand the interactions between those. And as we look to get those mitigation solutions out there, we need, as soon as possible, the understanding of how each of those mitigation options interact. Some are synergistic, some are in conflict, and we need to absolutely get to the bottom of it. This slide is a bit complex, but it goes right to the heart of the economics. This slide I have shown in DG Environment, DG Agriculture, DG Research. DG Research fell off their stool when they saw this slide. And I want again to publicly acknowledge the work that specifically John Bailey and his team, supported by Sinclair, did on this slide. This slide delivers sustainable intensification. On this particular one, it's about dairy. We have one about beef. And it goes to its core. So what we said in the land management strategy, the future of reducing our footprint and increasing profits was to utilise more grass of better quality. And I mentioned earlier on that our, uh, that our um, average for dairy production was 7.5 tonnes of utilisable grass. So we asked if we increased utilisation by just one tonne, not the 16 tonne, just the one tonne, what would happen? And if we increased ME of both grass and silage by 12%, what would happen? And we specifically were looking at phosphate, and I make no apologies about that. So anyone who's been following what's happening in the Netherlands, 
11% of dairy cows are currently being culled in the Netherlands. Why? It's because of this figure, fig, uh, figure here. The whole farm phosphate balance or surplus. It's defined in kilos of phosphate per hectare per year. That is basically the European Commission's um, metric that they judge us against. They believe a sustainable livestock farm should not create a surplus greater than five kilos of phosphate per hectare per year. In Northern Ireland at the moment, our current is 11.3. The Netherlands was at 18. And what our challenge was, our challenge was to ask someone to independently validate our recommendations. We engaged AFPI to do that. And we asked them what would happen our phosphate balance if we improved grass utilisation and we improved grass quality. And you can see just by doing that alone how dramatically we reduce the whole farm phosphate surplus. We then asked, well, what would happen if a milk price was low? What would happen if a milk price was high? And in each scenario, we dramatically improved net margin per hectare. If Northern Ireland, as an average, was to do this strategy on an annual basis, it's worth just under £200 million a year. Probably a very similar figure to where basic farm payments may or may not go post-Brexit, but I'm not going to uh, hypothesise on that, but just shows you what you can do. You can improve the environment, you can drive the economics, and you can deliver on both. One of the big areas we really struggled with was trying to get our head round the economics of mitigating ammonia. It's one of our big science gaps, one of our big knowledge gaps. The best attempt at this was carried out by Chagas, by Gary Lanigan and Chagas, and at least what he tried to do was put some costs against mitigating ammonia. I think the one thing, and, I, and I've talked to Gary about this, is it would have been nice to merge it with the greenhouse gases, because when you do that, you actually get more positives to the left-hand side of the screen. And it doesn't include the economic benefits of grazing, uh, extending grazing season and this issue about stabilised urea vis-à-vis -vis CAR. So one of the key things we have said in our, in our work, you cannot deliver profitable and sustainable farming unless you do it through science. We believe it is the only way. We believe that you need to implement what we already know, which we're not good at doing. We need to invest in what we don't know, and we know now we need to start learning about it. And ultimately, you need to measure, then manage, and measure again. And only then will you deliver profitable farming that reduces the environmental footprint and gives us a future. Thank you.